Hi, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers. And in this week's free training video, we're going to go over Excel Meeting Scheduler, where I'm going to show you how to create an amazing and comprehensive meeting scheduler in which you can quickly add staff to any meeting, double click to mark them as accepted. You have the ability to add different meeting notes, as well as adding attachments to any meeting simply by clicking Add File. We also have the ability to select any meeting to view those details it's going to be an amazing training let's get started all right thank you for joining me today this is going to be part one probably of a two or three part training because we've got a lot to cover in part one here we're going to go over the scheduling aspect of this as well as the ability to save meetings create meetings add to meetings, update meetings, and delete meetings. So we're going to go over that as well as the scheduling, how to put them on the schedule, how to refresh the schedule, how to create a scheduler, how to create the, the months here as well. So we've got a lot to cover today. In part two, we're probably going to create an email automation so that your staff and your meeting members can get automated emails based on the meeting details as well as the attachments so we're going to cover a lot I'm not sure exactly how much we're going to do on the communications but it's going to be a lot based on your feedback so I want to make sure that you put down in the comments below what you would like to see what you liked about this video what maybe what you didn't like what you'd like to see and the challenges that you face when you schedule your meetings so that perhaps we can add that automation right here into Excel. I want to make this a really powerful meeting scheduler. While Outlook and other applications do great jobs with meetings, I want to make something special in Excel so that you can see for yourself really the true power of Excel. It's really up to your imagination. So in this case, we've done a meeting schedule and let's go over some of those featured. And basically we have a month view here where we can view the entire month we have days that are grayed out that are not part of the month that's using conditional formatting and we'll go over that we have the ability to select on any meeting and it'll show the meeting details that that those include a meeting name a start time which can be updated we have a meeting date that can be modified with a pop-up calendar so let's go ahead and change that to the first and we also have a duration that can be changed as well we have staff list on another sheet in which we can add specific staff we automated the fact that they're tentative when they're added we added ability to double click when they are approved and we also have uh, the option of declining we have conditional formatting that automates the colors for our staff we've got test notes here we can add meeting agenda or notes here we also have the ability to add specific files and attachments for this specific meeting so if we're going to add a specific template or meeting or any type of file we can add it here simply by clicking and updating that you can delete them just by clicking delete so we can add attachments to any meeting we have the ability to change the scheduling year and we also have the ability to adjust the schedule based on the start date so you can have our start date is on sunday but you can change it to whatever you like so it's really really powerful application here once we click save changes those changes are saved and you'll see this meeting when from the third all the way to the first and it's got a different starting time so simply by changing the date let's say we change it to the eighth and then we click update or save changes all of a sudden it's moved to the eighth on our schedule so we also have the schedule being updated as well so it's going to be really powerful in that aspect that changes are extremely easy to make and I think in the second part maybe when we make a change like to a start time or perhaps a date we can automate the sending of emails and messages to our attendees perhaps only to those people who are tentative or accepted so in part two we're going to take care of some automation we're going to have lots of different triggers a trigger for email could be a change in the date a change in the time a new meeting it could be a changing of the meeting attachments or notes so perhaps any changes we make we can automate so that the recipients and the attendees get updates automatically so I'd like to add that in too we also have the ability to go previous month and next month so it's really comprehensive schedule we have the ability to add up to five different meetings per day you can increase this on yours but we've done it at five just so that we can keep the calendar and you know 
somewhat compact in order for you to see everything. We have month select buttons up at the top, so that's really nice as well. So that is basically it, all of the things that we have. We have a list of meetings. These are the list of all the meetings that we've created, and that's like our data and table database, so we have that set there. We've got a staff list here. We can add to that. You can add a different information onto this staff list. I've added positions as well, cell phone address. You can add a different additional uh, features and information to your staff list as you see fit. We have an attendees database. This is basically allows our attendees, all the attendees to all the meetings and they are secured by a meeting ID. So every meeting we create, we have a unique meeting ID and that meeting ID is here in this list under meeting ID. And then what we do is we link those. So we have both attendees, so we can have multiple attendees and they're always linked by this meeting ID. The same idea for attachments. We have different attachments. We have the file name, the path, and we'll go over in the schedule row in the database. It's going to be a long training. We've got so much to cover. So I'm going to move a little bit quicker because it's going to easily be an hour of training on this, perhaps more. I like to keep them close to an hour or less. But uh, I've got so much to cover in this one. So I do want to make sure we get that all in. So let's go ahead and move forward with this and onto the meeting schedule. We're going to start in this. And just like I said, we have the ability to save any changes and we have a fade out message. You've probably seen that in some of my applications before. Clicking save, you'll see in the upper right, meeting saved. That's a nice little alert to the user that a meeting has been saved without them having to click OK. We also have the ability to have new meeting, which we clicked, and then users can enter specific data. I've made the meeting name, start name, and meeting date all yellow so they're required so that means as the user fills in the color changes so that denotes that they are required we do want a start time we want a name for each meeting and we do want a meeting date those should be required fields and we've got a little pop-up calendar right here this is a shape based pop-up calendar that I created uh, you have the ability to, in this particular calendar to change colors so I really like this shape base because you can fit it with the theme of your specific application if you haven't seen this before I do have a dedicated video and download on this so that might help as well so we can simply click any date and then it'll appear and we also have the ability to add a duration on this as well meeting notes and the meeting attachments we can click the add file button you'll notice that that button appears uh, regardless of I just have one button and it's a really good feature because we have the ability to add many 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 attachments I don't want to create many many buttons I only want to create one button and then I want that button positioned based on the selection cell so that's really really great and I, I see this could be really helpful to a lot of people because I see a lot of people creating many many buttons and uh, since we know what row the user selected, we can use the same button, the same macro, because it's based on the selected row. So I'm going to show you how we do that as well. If you like the idea of that, I have a dedicated lesson on row buttons, and I'll make sure to include that uh, single row button so that we can add buttons based on the row user has selected. So I've gone over that as well in another video, and I'll make sure to include links by that below so you can have that as well. So that is a summary of the features, and uh, we can save our meeting, and it shows the meeting is saved, and then it automatically gets added to the calendar. And also, whatever the meeting is currently is selected is going to be in dark blue. We use conditional formatting. That way we always know what meeting has been selected simply by clicking there and using conditional formatting. And I'll show you how that's done as well. Conditional formatting I really love. You'll see me rarely color cells using VBA because conditional formatting is so fast and it doesn't create a lot of memory usage. So I really like that there as well. Okay, so we've gone over that and we have the ability to delete meeting simply by clicking the meeting, delete. We're going to get a confirmation if we want to delete the meeting. We'll say yes and the meeting is deleted and then we go ahead and refresh the schedule and you'll see now the meeting is gone. It was here and it's gone. So like I said, we've got a lot to cover. And before going into the VBA, let's go ahead and go over some of the conditional formatting that we have set up on this application. We'll go ahead and highlight just a selection of cells into the home conditional formatting, and we'll go ahead and manage the rules. And we've got a few ones. We've got about four conditional formatting. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. The first one is I want to show specific days in gray 
when the day itself is blank. When the day itself is blank, it means that the current month doesn't have a specific day on that day. So what we, in this case, for example, towards the end, you see these are in gray. And what happens there is when we have that rule, you'll see the day is blank there. And in this case, what we'll say is cell, format all cells that contain uh, that contain here blanks, blanks. And in this case, we've colored it gray, and that is for the heading, that is for the heading. However, we have other grays for the body, for the main day cell. And in that case, what we're gonna say is D29. And when we edit that rule, we'll see we create a rule called D29 equals blank, and this gets carried over. And why D29? Because that is the first cell in this row, the first cell in this row. And notice there's no dollar sign before D, it's relative. So that means it's gonna carry over to each column in our schedule, for each column. And we're gonna format that gray. So that means when a specific header row is blank, we can see that there is a gray text. So that covers us, however, for days that contain a date, it is not. So that's very important to show that. That's how we get the two different grays on dates. So that way when we switch for a month, you'll see certain days we have those same rules at the top. For every top and the bottom rows, we have that available. So that when it's blank, this is a darker gray, and this is a lighter gray only when this cell is blank. So we also have other rules. For example, when we have a cell that contains a value, there's a meeting there, we have a rule, and that's just simple. That is says a non-blank rule, so let's go ahead and take a look at that one. Here in this example, when we have a cell does not contain a blank. When it's not blank, we color it light blue. And that same conditional format is carried throughout the application. We have another one. I want to select the meeting row. For example, when we have selected a specific meeting like this one, I want it to show in dark blue. Now, how do we know that it is? Well, we can do this. We know that the we remember we're, we're storing our linked IDs here. So we can see that if there's a match, for example, see the selected ID is three here. So if we highlight, go over here, we'll see three here. So we're gonna say, we're gonna create a rule. Let's go what it, see what it looks like. It's just a simple rule and we'll go into conditional formatting and we see here, it's gonna be two. And we wanna make sure B3 does not equal blank and B3 equals BB6. Why BB6? BB6 because that is the first column in our ID table. ID, BB6, BB6 right here, right here. So it's relative, meaning it's not fixed. That means it's gonna cover as long as our, as long as our applies to also begins with six, it works. So as long as our applies to begins at D6, and our relative cell begins at BB6, it carries over properly. Let's go ahead and look at that one more time. Click on that and then go into the home, conditional formatting, manage rules, selecting on the highlighting, edit. Now pay attention here, B3, B3 equals BB6. This is relative, you see that means it's gonna cover for both cells to the left and below it covers this is the beginning point bb6 and notice that our applies to begins in d6 they begin on the same row so it's relative it'll cover the entire table so that allows us to basically create a rule where d6 through j40 d6 through j40 what we're saying is applies to this applies this anytime b3 which is fixed equals BB6 or any value in here, it'll mark that cell as highlighted. So that's how we do that. We also color the current day. Today is July 30th, 2018 that we're recording this. So that specific day will be in orange. And we can simply do that by adding the conditional formatting, manage rules if the value equals today. 
and then we carry that over all the way. So any value that equals a current date. So theoretically, we could put in, let's see, 730 here, and it would color it in orange because that is the current date as well. So it could carry for any cell that contains the current date. So that is conditional formatting. Now we can move into the VBA. We go over inside the coding there. All right, into the VBA we go. If you have the Developers tab available, you can click here, and then Visual Basic Alt F11 will also get you there. If you don't have the Developers tab open, you can click the File menu, and under Options, you can then go to the Customize ribbon and make sure that you have the Developers tab selected there. Let's get into it. We're going to start out with the on sheet macros that's the meeting scheduler that's here that is the only sheet that we have on sheet macros we have other modules of course with lots of macros but as far as the ma macros and code on the sheet we only have a little bit other than staff which is the selection row but we're going to go over the meeting scheduler and the first one that you see is before double click now we've added some macros that we want to happen on double click. Well, what is that? Let's go ahead and take a look back into the application and see what we have on double click. What I've done is when somebody is tentative, what I want to do is I want to make an easy way for them to click accepted. Now you can click the drop down list and click accepted, but I want to show you a different way by adding double click, which you can do. So simply by going out and then double clicking on that and clicking accepted, double click and it only works on when it's currently tentative so double clicking on anything other than something that has already been assigned to tentative will not work so only when it's assigned tentative double clicking will mark that as accepted so that's what i want to happen when some when a user has been assigned and it's tentative i want the user to be able to double click and show it is accepted so that's what i want to happen let's go back into the vba and see how we did that the first is we want private sub worksheet by double clicking and you can get that simply by locating the before double click here within the list of your on sheet worksheet codes here on the drop down list so once we locate that we can then go ahead and add that into here. So we've gone ahead and said, okay, if the user does double click between the range L9 and L40, then I want something to happen. However, I only want something to happen if the target value equals tentative. So if it doesn't, then nothing's gonna happen other than cancel is true. So if it's tentative then what then the target value equals accepted it's a very simple line of code basically saying in two conditions the first condition the user has double clicked on range l9 through l40 and that starts out on our application here is l9 and all the way down to l40 so if they double click on that then it will make in one more check to see if there is a text in there that shows tentative if those two conditions are true then the target value will yield equal accepted and then what we do is we write cancel is true that exits out of it if we don't have that line of code the cursor remains in the cell so let me go ahead and show you what that is without that so once they click on a tentative and then if you double click on here you'll see the cursor remains inside that cell and we really want it out so I want to exit I want to exit out of that so using cancel equals true enables us to do that when it's not commented out okay so that's how we go over the double click that's a very simple macro and you can use that in any type of application double clicking is pretty powerful so we have that ability next up we have worksheet change that is changes that users make within the worksheet and we have really we're going to focus on two areas we're going to focus on m9 through m40 and we're going to focus uh, on s4 and s5 so let's go ahead and take a look at both of those m9 through m40 this is on change of attendee but not on meeting load that means when a user changes an attendee somebody who has attended the meeting but not when the meeting and B2 equals false, meaning the meeting's not located. So that means in our macro to load a meeting, when we load that meeting, B2 is going to be true. When we finish loading that macro, B2 is going to go back to false. So basically, here's what I want to happen. When we load a meeting, when we select, you'll see all of the M, all of the attendees will fill in here. Well, I want something to happen. Here's what I want to happen. When a user selects 
a specific attendee, I want to automatically mark them as tentative. Because generally, you can keep that or remove it, but generally when we schedule something, we, have, we don't know if they've accepted or not, so we want to generally mark them as tentative until they have actually accepted that they are going to be available and coming to the meeting. So we want to mark them as tentative. So here's, I want that to happen, but I don't want that to happen on meeting load. For example, let's just say, let's delete that. Okay, so we have, we have one specific member attending the meeting who does not have a status. Let's go ahead and save that changes. And now we're going to load the meeting. And you see when we load the meeting, right, it, here's another one, right? And so there's no, and then we click on another one. And you'll see that nothing has changed here, right? Even though we did make a change to this cell, but nothing has changed there. Why is that? Because the meeting was loading. We don't want to make any changes. So that's why we have another check to make sure B2 is false load meeting here in B2, false. When we load the meeting, this goes to true, then it goes right back to false. So basically what I want to explain to you is that when a user makes a change, when a user makes a change, I want something to happen. But when we load this meeting, I don't want that to happen. So there's changes to this cell on two different occasions. One occasion, the user manually selects it, and then I want tentative to show up. The other one is when the meeting is located, but I don't want to change. So that's why we have that there. So that means that when someone schedules a meeting, I want it to, and we we do have required save changes. Once those changes are saved, the, the fade out message comes and it's saved. So that is the reason. So let's continue on with this macro. So B2 must be false. Then if the target value does not equal empty, that means the user has to put in a name, right? If I if I double click on here, right, and I go inside it, but I don't enter anything, and I click enter, I don't want anything to happen, right? I want to make sure that this actually includes some text or a name, so we don't want anything to happen. So we put this check in, does not equal empty, and L does not equal empty. What does that mean? L in the target row does not equal empty. What that means is if we've already assigned them a status, I don't want to change that. For example, let's say we we know this person, let's say somebody's accepted, right? We don't when we make a change here, if it's if this is not empty, I don't want to change it automatically. I only want to change it if it's empty, right? So when we schedule Lisa Lopez and it's empty, it goes to tentative. But if we have already set a specific status, I don't want that to change. So that means status must be empty column l must be empty so that is why we don't want to change it automatically we don't want to change it if it's empty so l in the target row must also be empty so those are the two conditions so the target must not be empty and l in the target row must be empty then in that case l in the target row equal tentative so that's how we set the default all right, so that's how we cover the automatic. You can change this however you like. So you may not like my automation, but you can change it however you like. That is the beauty of why I'm teaching you how to do this, not just to, to use what I have done for you, but to, to make it your own and make changes and keep the customizations as you like it, as your company requires or as your the applications that you're marketing, change them how you feel. Next up, S4 and S5. What are those? Those are the year and the week. When I make a change to either, let's move over to S5. It's not this. When we move over to S4 or S5, when I make a change, I need this schedule. I need the schedule to refresh, right? Because if I make it, if I if I change this to Monday, I need that whole schedule to change over. Everything's got to change here, right? Because now it's going to start on Monday, right? Before it started on Sunday. So we need to make sure. So that means that we need to run the macro. That macro refreshes that schedule. And the same thing, if I change the year, I also need that schedule to automatically refresh so that the appropriate meetings can come in. So what I'm saying is if there's a change to S4, or if there's a change to S5, then reload that schedule. Let's put it back on 18 and put it back on Sunday as we had it before. So that's what I'm going to say in this macro here. That's all we're doing. If the user, if there's a change to S4 or S5, then load this month. We're going to go over that macro a little bit later on, but this macro refreshes all the meetings within that given month. So those are just the 
macros that we cover on sheet worksheet chains. The next is deactivate, and we've been over this before. This basically has to do with the shape based calendar, and this basically says if the user has deleted the calendar, then we need to make sure that we undo whatever they have done. So just in case, we, we need to make sure that we undo so that the calendar can be refreshed because that's a shape-based calendar. So just in case there's any issues with the calendar, we want to undo those issues. So that is the reason for that. So that's just based on the calendar itself. Next up, we have some macros. We have the same type of macro in case they, un they delete the calendar. This will refresh and make sure that we undo. So that covers that calendar. I did cover that in the calendar specific video here so this shape based calendar does have its own video so we can explain that's on my channel as well all right so let's get into the specifics this also has to do with calendar as well p5 is nothing that means if we make a change a selection change to p5 we need to show that calendar we're going to check to make sure that we have the calendar sheet and we're going to show the calendar otherwise we're going to hide the calendar so that means that let's go over that first if we select p5 we want that calendar showing up if we select any other cell it hides it select p5 shows the calendar select any other cell hides the calendar so that's exactly what we've done in this code here select p5 show the calendar and check run this macro else means they select something other than p5 hide the calendar, run the macro that hides the calendar, run the macro, this check for sheet just to make sure the calendar exists. And like I said, I've gone over this in another video. We're not focused on this, but I did want to let you know what that entails. Next up, we have selection change, and these are all the cells within the calendar, D6 through J10, D12 through J16, and so on and so forth. That covers all of the cells within this calendar here, right, covers all of these. D6 through J10, D16 through J, D12 through J16. So that's the selection of all the cells in the calendar. Because we, what I want to do is I want to, when we select it, if there's a value here, I want to load the meeting. That is the reason. On selection, if there's a value, if there's no value, nothing's going to happen, right? But if they select something that has a value, we want to load that meeting and all the meeting details along with the agenda and the meeting attachments. So we've covered that right here. So we're going to say, if the user has selected any cell within that range, if the target value is not empty, then do following things. What do we want to do? Well, first of all, I need to pull in the meeting ID. I need to know. I need to know what meeting to load. You see, there's no meeting ID here. There's no meeting. There's only the time of the meeting and the name of the meeting. But I need that meeting ID. That meeting ID is key. Without that, I don't know what meeting to load. I can't load a meeting based on the time and the day. I need to know the meeting ID. Well, we store the meeting ID 50 columns, and I mean exactly 50 columns to the right. Here is where our meeting IDs are stolen. So I know the meeting ID, for example, this is column 54, right? This is column four. D is column four, right? So exactly 50 columns to the right is where we're going to store our meeting IDs. So that means it says, okay, if the user selects, if user selects a meeting on row 12, column four, then I know to say, okay, the meeting ID, and I want to put that meeting ID right here in B3. I want to put that meeting ID right here. So, but how do I get it? Well, I know it's row 12 column 54 if this is column four so that means i know how to get that meeting id and it's right here seven right that meeting id we place that there and i'll show you in the code how we get it there but what that does is enables us to get pull the meeting information even when the meeting id which is what we need isn't displayed here we don't need to show the meeting id here i want to show what's important which is the start time and the meeting name meeting id can be hidden all right, it's all the way over here. We don't need to see that. The user doesn't need to see that, but we need to know it. So 54, column 12, is where we store that meeting. We put that right here. Once it's there, then I know what meeting to load. That means I can know, I know that meeting 7, right, is in column 10 right here, and I can pull the data from the meeting list. I can pull all this data, and I can pull all of it. So that's why we know the meeting ID is critical. So back into the code b3 equals cells the target row right the row doesn't change 
the column, the target column in that case was 4 plus 50. So the column to combine, 4 plus 50 is column 54. Row 12, column 54, what is the value? Well, that's the meeting ID. We want to put that right here. And now just we're going to do a run a double check just to make sure that we do have a meeting ID. If B3 does not equal empty, then we're going to run the macro, the meeting load macro. That macro, which we're going to go over in a little bit, will pull that meeting ID and load the meeting for us. So that is why that's critical. So that's why we covered that. Next up, I know I'm moving fast because we got a lot to cover. Next up, selection change. What I want to do is I want to add that file button. Remember the attachments button? Well, if the user makes a selection change anywhere from O23 to P40, then I want something to happen. Well, what's going to happen? Let's go ahead and take a look. Remember that meeting attachments button here. When a user makes a change to O23, I want that add file to pop up right there. Any selection change they make, I want that button to pop up right there. Because when they click that button, I want them to be able to easily add a file to whatever row they have selected. And it will add that file right here. So that's what I want. I want that information. So I need that button to appear right there. And this code that I'm about to show you will show you that. So if a user makes a selection from O23 to P40, then what do I want to do? Well, in this case, I want to, we're working with this add file button, the shapes. I've given that name to that button. Let's take a look. Right click on the button or just click on the button. And you'll see the name add file button. I've assigned that name to this shape. And this shape is simply a group. It's a square button with an icon. That's it. It's made up of those two things. So this is a group of shapes. And I've given that specific group the add file button name. So that way I can hide it or show it using that name right within the code. All right, back into the VBA we go. So we're working with this. The first thing we want to do is I want to make it visible. The second thing I want to do, we don't need this increment. I'm happy with the way it's located. The second thing I want to do is I want to position this Q and the target row left. The column Q plus whatever the target row, the row that the user has selected. And I want to place it on the top, Q, column Q and the target row. So that means it's just going to be right on the left of column Q. Here's column Q. So that means I want that button just to the left, left of column Q. So that is helpful. So that means if we reduce this, it's still going to stay the same. It's going to be the same. If we increase this, also the same position. So that's really, really helpful. So we can, now that button is powerful. Now when we add that macro, it's going to, whatever line we've selected, it's going to put those details in. And while we're at it, let's unhide these. There's some code in here I want you to see. They're hidden. This white font now. Normally, you won't want to see it. But it's important for our purposes. Let's go ahead and make that font black here because I need to know the row and we'll go over that and I need to know the full path this is just the name but I need the full path and we're gonna go we have some hidden things right here too let's go ahead and unhide that this column is also used for some numbering let's go ahead and make that black and we will go ahead and expand that and then you're gonna be able to see some numbers here we're gonna use those and I'll show you how they're used and that's gonna link up to the database and I'll show you that in just a bit so we've uncovered that now next up so we've placed that button however if the user selects anything other than this else then I want to hide it if they select anything other than that let me see how that works so we've shown the button here but what if they select outside hide it right select inside show it select any other cell hide it so that is what that code does else the add file button visible equals false so that hides it that is all of the code that we're focused on for the on sheet next we're going to focus on the modules and all the code within those modules all right, moving out, let's go into the month selection macro here. And these are when we select the specific month buttons, we want some things to happen. We're going to change all of the other months. First of all, we're going to change them to style 37. And then we're going to change the specific month that we have selected to style 23. And then we're going to set the month number in B7. So we've done that for each. So let's go ahead and take a look at how that works in the application. 
once we select on a specific month we want to change the color here we've changed it to light blue and we've changed all of the others to darker blue so we've done that and as well we've changed the month number so you can see that the month number in b7 changes to the month number april is four may is five june and july so we also want this month number here and i also automatically get the first day in the first month based on that month number and we use a formula for that the first day of month is date the schedule year and the schedule year is currently a named field which is s4 so schedule year is s4 you can see here if we select s4 you can see the name here SC year, schedule year, that is our year. So we use that name within our formula, and that's done right here. So schedule year, the selected month, that is also a name manager, and that is right here. Select a month, SEL month is B7. So we've given that a name as well. We can use that within the code. And then one is the first day of the year. So the date would be the year, month, and then the day since we're on the first date we've wrapped that and if error i just want to make sure if there's any errors for any reason it's going to return blank and not an error message so we've wrapped that and very similar to the last day of the month however we're going to use end of month end of month is going to show whatever month b8 is going to be the date of the month you know the first of the day and then we're going to want zero months above or zero months ahead we want the exact month of that specific month which in this case is july and that's going to give us the last date of the month using eo month end of month formula we've also wrapped that in an if error and return blank if there is an error because i want to make sure that there's no issues with that so the selected month goes in b7 so within those macros for each month select two we've assigned macros to each of those month buttons April would have assigned macro select four, five for May, and so on and so forth. Each of these macros are the same for the most part. We color the current button differently, and we also set the month number in B7. So that's pretty simple with those months just right there. The months button is a group of all the months button. This way we can color them all at the same time because we've grouped them together. So when we select, you can see all of them and the name we've given to them is months button. So this way when we want, what we do is we change them all to dark blue first, all of them, including the select one. And then we change the selected one to the light blue theme. And you can get that simply by running a macro while you're changing a theme and that'll show you which number theme it is so it's simply running a macro when you're changing those recording a macro i should say when you're changing those will show which shape style preset which which number preset will show up here so that'll be helpful when you want to change the colors to something different other than the blue light blue so those are the month select macros. Let's go ahead and move in to the next module, which is the meeting load. And this macro runs every time we load a meeting. And what do we want to do? It's a little bit involved, but we'll go over that just so you know. When we're gonna when we run that macro and we select a specific meeting, we select something here and we showed you how that happens. And then what happens is we want to clear out all the fields first. We then want to pull in our meeting name, our start time, our meeting date, and our duration, all four of those fields, when we select on that meeting based on the ID. So these four fields are going to be pulled in from our meeting list, name, date, start time, duration, and agenda. We want all of these fields from this table here, and we want them pulled into these four fields, and then this is the fifth one here. So we then want we do is we want to take that meeting ID and we want to run an advanced filter. For example, if the meeting ID is six, we want to know from all of the attendees only those with the meeting ID six. And we want to run them through an advanced filter. And here's the results. Then the results, we want to take these results along with their status, the name, the row of the database. This is the row of where they're stored here, right? So we keep track. So that means if we make a change, it changes automatically in the database cell. That's really, really important. And is what row they're in the schedule. I want to know what row in the schedule. For example, David Davis is in row 9. John Jacobs is in row 10. Let's look at that. David Davis is in row 9. 
John Jacobs is in row 10. This way, if you make a change, they go back to the, when you load a meeting, whatever name, whatever order they were set is the order that's going to be brought back. So that's really important. So if you add a name at the end or you make a change, if we change David Davis to Fred Fredders and we save those changes, and then it's going to load, when we load that meeting, it's going to remember Fred Fredders at the top position. That way, when we go to the attendees, now in row, the schedule row nine, Fred Fredders is the name. So that way, exactly whatever changes you have made are going to show up and they're going to show up in the right order. So I want that as well. So we're going to load those meetings and we're also going to load the attachments using pretty much the same method. When we look at attachments, we're going to set the meeting ID and I want to know all the attachments within that specific meeting ID. So that's very, very important and I wanted to show you that as well so that we can use that. All right, so let's go back into that macro and walk you through, now that you know what the process is, let's go ahead and walk you through that macro. All right, first we've dimensioned meeting row, last attending row. Attending row and last as long. We have our variables here as long. You have them in two different rows. You can put them in multiple rows. We've defined the meeting ID as a variant. Maybe it's going to be text, maybe variable. So we have it set as a variant. And next up, what we want to do is I want to make sure that when we load the meeting, B3 must not be empty. Remember, B3 is where our meeting ID is located. It is that meeting ID that's going to get us all the information from both our meeting information, from our attendees, and our attachments. So the meeting ID is critical. That is the critical link that links everything together. So we need that. We need to make sure that B3 has our meeting ID. So that's got to that's gotta be there in order for us to load everything. So we've stored that in B3. Here's our meeting ID 6. Okay, next up we have our, once we know that we have our meeting ID, we need to define it. B2, we're going to set the meeting load to true in B2. Remember, we went over that. We want to make sure that when we're loading a meeting, nothing else happens. No macros happen. We're going to set it to true because there are some things, for example, when we selection change, when we make a change, we need to make sure that, for example, when we change to tentative, we want to make sure B2 is false. So when we're loading the meeting, B2 goes to true, and then nothing, none of this will happen. This will not happen when it's loading. So that is why we have that. B2 is true. Meeting ID, we're going to set that variable to whatever's in B3. And then we're going to set the meeting row in B4. Now, how did we get that meeting row? Well, we use match formula, and we'll go over that. The meeting row is matching B3. And then we have meeting ID. This is a named range for our meeting, and I'll go over that in a moment. We want an exact match, so our match is going to return zero. And then I'm going to add three. Why are we adding three? Well, let's go over that. Let's go ahead and take a look in our meeting list, and we're going to go into formulas, name manager, and we're going to look up meeting ID. Let's go ahead in here and take a look at meeting ID. Tab over, and we'll see that meeting ID contains all of the following. It's an offset formula, so that means as our list grows, so does this named range. It grows since we're using offset. We're using account A, and then offset meeting list starting at C4, count A, counting all of the items in the meeting list, counting all of those. So we want to make sure that we count them, and that is going to be our meeting ID. Now, you'll notice that this starts on row 4. Four is our meeting. So when we want to know, if I want to know what row 5 meeting ID 5 or meeting ID 6 is, if I want to know what row it is, we're going to locate it. It's going to be the 6th one, and we're going to add 3 to that. We're going to add 3 so that we can know it's on row 9. So that's just what we've done here. When we get the row, when we get the row here, we're going to add 3 because this will return 6. This mass will return. It's going to find it six item in that list then we're going to add three that will give us the row which is row nine in that case so that we need to we need to also know the meeting row why do i need to know the meeting row because once i have the meeting row i can pull the name i can pull the date i can pull the start time the duration and the agenda i need to pull all that and bring it right in here but i need to know the row first so once we've defined the row we can then pull everything else in all right let's continue once we have defined the row, we can then, we want to clear out anything, clear exa any existing meeting values since we're going to be loading new meeting information. We want to clear out all of those fields. 
we're going to stop the calculations. What this does is it stops the automatic calculations and screen updating. You can find those macros here if you're familiar with coding. We use that a lot. Application enable events true. For the reset, for stop, we're going to make them false, the calculation manual, and the screen updating false. This speeds up our code tremendously when we turn off stop calculation. You'll want to make sure that when you start a macro, this is in your macro, you, before the macro ends, you must reset the calculations. We need events to be true, calculations to be automatic, and screen updating to be true. So you'll notice also at the end of our code, we also have reset calculations, so that's very important. And you'll also notice that I stop this calculation after anything anything that might exit the sub. If I put it here, if I put the stop calc here, and then we and then the user B3 for some reason is is empty, they're gonna exit right here. So that's important. We can either A reset it, we have the choice of resetting it here, which is fine, or we can just put the stop below that. So I've chosen to put the stop below that, so that covers that. And so we're going to stop it after any choices that might exit the sub or any reasons that the sub might exit. So we've done that. Next up, it's simply a matter of mapping the data. M5 is where the meeting name is going to go. P5 is where the meeting date. So we know that our meeting name is in column D. We know our meeting date is in E and the meeting row. Again, go back into the meeting list. We know that our meeting name is in column D. We know that the date is in E, start time, duration, G, and F. And we know the row, so that means we can easily bring in those values to go into their M5, M6. So we're bringing all of those values into that simply by bringing, using those mapped, we know the row. So we can, even if we add a duration and click save changes, we can also, then the duration is being brought in here as well. So that's helpful. And let's go ahead and go back into the VBA and con continue with this. So we have all those items. You know how we pull the data from the meeting. Sheet 6 is our meeting list. We know how to pull the data into our current sheet, Sheet 1, and all those values. So that's how we load the main data. I know I'm moving a little bit fast, but we got so much to cover. You can watch this video as many times as you like. Of course, please download the free version. You'll see the links in the description below or perhaps in the comments. So make sure you download your copy and try it for yourself and watch the video over and over again if you need to. Moving along, now we need to load the attendees. And basically what I want to do is this. I want to run an advanced filter. We know, we know the meeting ID. It's going to be here. We've defined the meeting ID. And what I want to do is I want to go into the attendees database. I want to first determine the last row. In this case, it's 53. I want to run an advanced filter with all of this data. I want to put that meeting ID right here and I want to then run an advanced filter based on that meeting ID and I want to return all of the attendees that have the meeting ID 6 and I want to return the meeting status, the attendee name, the database row and the schedule row. I want to return all of this data and I want to have it appear here. Then what I want to do is I want to copy this information over here, the meeting status and the attendee name. I want to copy these three information. I want to paste it right in here. So we have the status, the name, and the row, and this is helpful. Why do I need the row? Why do I need the database row? Because if I make a change to this, right, to David Davis, I need to know what row in the database to change, right? I need to know row 45 in the database is now going to be there. And now I haven't made the change yet. Let's take a look. Attendees, row 45. Let's scroll down to row 45. Let's take a look at here. Now row 45 is showing Mary Davis, right, is declined. So we know that, but I need to know what row. If I'm going to make a change, I need to know what row in the database. So when we go back and we schedule this to David Davis and then we save those changes, it knows what row in the database to make this change to David. So when we go back into the attendees, now we see row 45 is David Davis. And we can do the same thing. Let's say Davis has accepted, change that to accepted and click save changes back into the attendees database and now on row 45 we see David has accepted. So when we save the data it knows exactly what row. That row is important. Now how do we know that row? Well we, what we do is we put this 
we put this right here. All it does is say rho is 45. We just use that formula. Now we know the rho here, but, but when we run the advanced filter, it's important that we get that rho right here because I need to bring in that rho. So now we know what rho, it's just the value. We don't need the formula anymore. I just want the value of the row. So when we bring that row, we bring it here, we know what row in the main database to change. We did the exact same thing for attachments. We know what row the attachments are. Sales chart XLS is in row 24. We go to row 24. Here we know we see the sales chart and we know it's beating at day six. So that really, really helps us. And that is how, and I know a lot of you struggle with that. And it took me a while to come up with that concept, but it's really great. I use it almost every day in the applications when you have something called one too many. What do we mean by one too many? Well, in this meeting, we have one meeting, right? But we have many attendees. We have many attachments. When you have one too many, you need to store these in a different database. Because we don't want, what I don't want is to have a different column for attendee one, another column for attendee two. And you know, I don't want to do that because I want to have probably 50, maybe 100, maybe thousands of possible attachments or uh, possible items. So one too many requires a different table. So we have a different table for attendees. We have a different table for attachments. And But as long as they're linked by the same meeting ID or employee ID or customer ID or whatever ID number you have, as long as they're linked, then we can do that. So that's a very important concept to get. And I want to make sure you get that. Anytime you have one to many or many, you need to have that type of separation for your database. So that's a really important concept to get. And once you get that, it just really opens it up and becomes really powerful. All right, let's move on to meeting and attendees and status. Now we're going to attendees. We know the last attendee row is we need to get that for C sheet 4 C99. Once again, when we go to the attendees, I need to know we're going to run the advanced filter. I need to know the last row. In this case, it's 53. But when we run our advanced filter and we include C3 all the way to G and the last row, that's going to be our advanced filter. We're going to run that. We've gone over advanced filter a lot in the past videos. Then we're going to run the criteria. Criteria is going to be AA1 all the way to AE2. AE2. And the most important thing is this uh, ID number here. Our results are going to be AB3 to AE. So that's what we're going to do and we're going to do that right in the code. Once we have the last row, we need to make sure that the last row is not less than four. If it is, go to no attendees. That means if there's no attendees at all, we're going to skip all that and go right to here. Next up, we are going to clear any data that might be in here. We're going to clear that A2. That's going to clear our criteria here. And this is going to clear our advanced filters. This is going the results. So this is going to clear any data that we may have had from a previous. So again, we're going to clear this area, AA2, through AE2. And we're going to also clear this data too. I want all that cleared so that when we run our advanced filter, we have a new, fresh information here. So we must clear that out first. Next up, we want to put the meeting ID in AA2. You just saw that right there. That is our criteria. We're ready for the advanced filter now. Sheet 4, C, 3, G. We just went over that. And the last row, that is our main data. We're going to run the advanced filter. I want to copy over that information. So Excel filter copy. I don't want to filter it in place. We're going to set the criteria to AA1 through AE2. We just went over that. And what we want is we want those results. And where do I want those results? I want them in AB3 to AE3. AB3 to AE3. Right here, AB3 to AE3. I want those results there. And we want to make sure to include the headers. Always make sure those header rows are always the same. They must be matching. If not, you will get an error. All right, so you always want to make sure that the names and header names match whatever they are in the original database. That's critical. All right, moving right along. Next, we need to pull up the last attend filter row. I need the last row of the results. And we're going to use AC, the column AC, and that is where our attendee name is. So we're going to say, the, what is the last? In this case, let's go ahead and run that code again and update that. So I need to know the last row. When we select, we need to know the last row of our, in this case, it is uh, 
row 11, but I need to find out AC and the last filtering row of the results, which is in this case, it is 11. So we're, we need to pull the data, so I need to get that last row. And we can do that through this line of code, last attendee filter row equals sheet four range AC 999. That is the last row of data. We're gonna run a check to make sure that there is data within the filter. And we're going to say if the last 10 filter row is less than three, then go to no attend. No attend will be right down here. So we would skip this. All right, next we're going to run a loop. We want to run a loop and we're going to add in each individual rows. We're going to say the schedule row, the scheduling row is equal to AE in the filter row. That is the row on the schedule this row AE I need to know what row because I need to know what row to put the data in I can't just copy and paste all this data because the rows might be mixed up so we need to pull each row and then make sure each row in row 9 I know to put this these three items we're gonna say L through N and the row equals AB through AD AB through AD so we know the row, and now we know the information to add in. So that's just what we did in our code. Once we have that row, we're going to say L for, this, for the sheet 1, and the schedule row through N, and the schedule row equals sheet 4, A, B, and the filter row, and A, D, and the filter row, so A, B through A, D. We're going to copy that over. So once again, let's just go over that one more time. We're going to say that L through N equals AB through AD. So that means the database row along with the status and the name come all the way through. In fact, it's status name. We've changed the order here, which is fine. As long as the headings are the same, the order doesn't necessarily need. All right, let's go ahead and rerun that macro and click on the sales meeting again. And we got a refresh and I've updated the data now. We can see the rows here and you'll see the order is status, name, and row. And that is the same order that we have in our status name and row so I've changed the rows in the column order so that they meet the exact requirements of our schedule status name and database row so we have that there and that is how we get that back into the code we go let's go ahead and continue down so we know that the last row and now we're gonna run our schedule and then we're gonna go to the next so this is our loop here so we're going to go for filter row we use the last filter so we're going to do that for each of the items in there so that is how we do that we're going to run through this low four to the last filter row so for each attendee we're going to run this we're going to first we're going to get the schedule row, and then we're going to place in the data and we're going to do something very similar for the meeting attachments the last first of all we're going to get the last row of the attachments when we go into the database I need the last row of our attachments in this case it's 19 but I need that last row so we're going to define that last row we're going to put in the meeting ID we're going to clear out all the information clear this out then we're going to put in the meeting ID we're going to run the advanced filter we're going to get our two attachments in this case we're going to bring our attachments over to our scheduling database and then we're going to update it in our schedule and into the schedule our attachments are going to appear right here we're going to have our name, our database column, and our full file name, our full file path here. So those three items are going to be placed here. So that's how we're going to do that with the attachments. Let's go back into the code. Again, we're going to get the last row of the attachments. We're going to check to make sure there are actually attachments. If, the, if it's less than four, we're going to skip it all and go right to here. Next up, we want to clear out the information, clear out any remaining advanced filters through this line of code. We're going to set the meeting ID to AA2. That's important. That's going to be our criteria so that we can filter out all other attachments unless they have a specific meeting ID. Then we're going to run our advanced filter. Our main data is here, C3 through G in the last attachments row. Again, we're going to copy it over. We're going to set the criteria for AA1 through AA2. In this case, our criteria is only our meeting ID. Oops, let's go back in there. Only our meeting ID, so we want to make sure to set that meeting ID for our criteria. We're going to copy over to the range. We're going to copy that to AB3 through AE3, and we want unique true. We're going to copy that data over so that we have our results into the attachments. We want our 
AB3 to AE3, we want our results right here. We're going to then take those results and we're going to place them right in here on our scheduling here. We're going to place those right here. So that is how we do that. Let's go back into the code and finish that up. Next up, we have the attachment, last attachment row. We need to make sure that we get the last row, which is AB9. I need to know the last results row. Well, what are the last results row? They're in attachments right here. Our last row in this case is five because I need to know how many, I need to know how many to loop them. We're going to start at four and go to five. In this case, our loop is only going to be two rows. So we're going to go do that. So we need to get that last row, which is right here. We're going to run a check to make sure that the last attachment row is not less than three. That should be important. So next up for attachment row equals four to the last attachment row. We can change this. It should be less than four since we're starting at four if it's less than four. Okay. So our attachment filter row is four to the last. In this case, four to five. We're going to get that schedule row. I need to know the row to put it on the schedule, and that is located in column AE. Column AE tells us what row to put it in in our schedule, AE. That means it's going to go in row 23 and row 24. Let's look at that. Row, let's scroll over here, row 23 and row 24. We know what row to put them in now. So we need to get that row. It's very important. So we pull that in our code from the return. So we know what row. So Q O through O value O on the scheduling row equals A B. That's the file name. Next up we have the database row. That goes in column Q in the schedule and we're pulling it from column A E. Next up we want the file path. That goes in R and we pull it from A C. Again, let's go over that once more again. In the meeting schedule, we have column O, that is our file name. In column Q is our database column. In column R is our long file name. Pulling that right here. File name from AB, path from AC, database row from AD. So we just pull those items and we bring them into them. We don't use copy and paste because we don't know what order because we have to put, each time we have to pull the row, the schedule row from here. So that is how that works and that's how we load the meeting. Let's just finish up the macro here. What we want to do is I want to, when we load it, I want to show the existing meeting group. In case it's a new meeting group, I want to make sure to hide the new meeting group. What is that? Those are shapes. Those are shapes based on our, let's go ahead and take a look in our meeting and schedule and see if we can't show that. Let's expand this a little bit. Now up we have a group here. These are button groups. We're going to use this group for existing. If we have an existing meeting, we show this group. Save, new, and delete. We only want these buttons to show up when we have an existing meeting. And I've named that group existing meeting group here. I only want to show it because when I want to click on a new meeting, I want to hide that group. All I want to do here is be able to save I just want to save it so that we create a new group. But however, if I if I select outside and I load a group, I want to hide this save meeting. I want to hide the new meeting group and I want to show the existing meeting group. So I want to do those two things. When I select something, I want to hide the new meeting and I want to show the existing. So when we load it, we need to do those items again. So when we load, we want to sh the existing meeting, we want to show the new meeting group we want to hide. We do that here. We're going to set the load meeting back to false, B2 equals false. And we're going to make sure since we've selected an existing meeting, we want to make sure that the new meeting goes to false. This tells us if it's a new, B5 tells us if it's a new meeting or not. B5 right here, new meeting or old meeting. In this case, we want to make sure if we select an existing meeting, if we select new meeting, right, this changes to true. B5 changes to true. But if we select an existing meeting, it changes back to false. So we need to know the difference between new meetings or existing meetings. And I'll show you why in the macro in, in just a bit. So that's it. We reset the calculations. And that is the macro that we use to load the meeting. Next up, we're going to cover meeting new and delete. New meetings and deleting a meeting. All right. Next up, we have a module called meeting new and delete. And basically, in this module, we have two macros, one for new meeting and one for deleting. 
in the new meeting, basically what I want to do is I want to with sheet one, I want to set B5 to true. I need to know that it's a new meeting and I want to make sure to clear out all of the fields that for the other meeting, anything else that might have been in there. So B3, which shows the meeting ID, M5, M6, P5, and P6, those are the meeting details, such as time, name, date. And then L, and L through N is the any uh, attendees, as well as O, P through there, and as well as O and R are all of the attachments, information that we show. We want to clear all of that out for the meeting. And I want to set the new meeting group. These are the buttons that I just showed you. I want to display that, and I want to hide the existing. Then I'm going to select N5. N5 is the meeting name. So we're going to select that for the user so they can start typing in a new meeting name. That is how that macro works. It's pretty simple. Deleting a meeting is also relatively simple. First, we want to add in a message box. Are you sure you want to delete this meeting? We're going to give it the option of buttons VB yes or no, and then the title of delete meeting. And they're going to say if this equals no, then exit the sub. So they will not continue further if they say no. If they say yes, we're going to check, make a check first. B before we want to make sure that there's a row attached to this specific meeting. We need to make sure that it's not blank. B4 is where our meeting row is. Remember, if there's an error, it's going to be blank. So we need to run a check. If it's blank, just leave, ex exit the sub. If it's not blank, we can continue on with deleting that specific meeting. So moving on, we're going to set the meeting row to B4. Meeting row is going to be set to B4. Let's exit out of there. And so once we have that meeting row, we can then go to sheet six, which is where our meetings are located. And then it's going to say the meeting row and colon and the meeting row, entire row, delete. Now, there's additional items that you can do. We did not delete any details from attachments or attendees in those databases. You can run advanced filters that do that. So in other words, we've deleted the main meeting information. It's not going to show up on the schedule. It won't show up anymore. However, we did not delete any of the attachments or any of the attendees from that meeting. You can run an advanced filter just as we did here. You can then take each database row and delete this delete row, delete this row, and delete this row. You can do that as well. You know, this meeting, this is already over an hour, so we didn't do that on this, but you can do that. It's not critical, but uh, if you're going to be using this a lot and uh, you don't want to fill up your database, you may want to to also delete the individual's attendees for that specific meeting ID as well as the attachments if you have any but we did not do that here okay moving on with the code that is what we do for delete we're going to then once we're going to set meeting new we're going to go back to the new meeting and we're going to run this macro and then we're going to reload the month I want to refresh the month because I don't want that meeting showing up for example if we have dinner meeting at 2.45 here on the 10th, and I delete that macro, let's go ahead and click on the delete, let's recreate this, let's go ahead and delete that, and it says, are you sure you want to delete the meeting? Yes, goes into the new mode, and all of a sudden that meeting, the schedule has been refreshed, and you see that it is no longer there. So load the new meeting, get it ready for the new meeting, and also refresh the schedule so that the meeting no longer appears on the schedule. We do that with just those two macros here, meeting new and load month. Run, we're running that, so that takes care of that. So that is how we do new meetings and delete the meetings updates. Let's go ahead and go into the save and update. This is how we save a meeting. We're going to go over that as well. Let's go ahead and back into the schedule. And when we select on a meeting, we want to load that meeting. OK, so when we have a meeting located, we make a change. I want to save those changes. And we're going to click Save, and those changes are saved. Also, when we do a new meeting, we add information. We want to save those. Let's just say breakfast meeting. We clear a new meeting, and we uh, set a start time of, let's say, 5.45 AM, early breakfast. We give it a date of, let's say, the 13th, and a duration of, uh, let's say, one hour. And we give it some notes 
and we give it some attendees, we want to make sure all that is saved. So we add some attendees. They're all tentative until they respond. Now that we've added them, we want to save that meeting. We just click Save, and all of a sudden, it is there on Friday at 5.40 a.m., AM and uh, we've selected that so save that is what we're going to be doing now now I've used the same macro for both saving existing meetings and saving changes and saving new we can use the same macro there's only a few slight differentiations and we'll go over that right now back into the VBA code we have save update meeting right here Let's take a look. We've defined meeting rows, attendee rows, and just as we had did before, attachment rows as long and meeting ID as variant, so that hasn't changed. We're going to be working primarily with sheet one, and we also want to make sure that we have decided if it's a new meeting or not. I need to know if it's a new meeting or not, and B5 is going to tell us that. Remember, if B5 equals true, then it's a new meeting, else it's an existing meeting. If it's a new meeting, we want the meeting row is going to be the last row of our meeting, the last row plus one, plus one. So the last row plus one is where we're going to put that new meeting. Sheet six, let's go over that. Sheet six, our meeting list is going to be our last row plus one. So in this case, it's 16. So we need to define the row. If it's an existing meeting, if it's an existing meeting, we know the row is going to be right here, B8. So new meeting, first row, existing meeting, B8. We already had defined it. So we know that. So let's go back into the code and follow along. Meeting row is going to be, if it's a new meeting, it's going to be here. If it's an existing meeting, we know that it is right here before before okay if it's an existing meeting we are go also going to run a check to make sure that before has a value if not just in case we're going to run a message by saying please correct a please select a correct meeting to edit and then exit just going to run a little bit of a check right there to make sure that the existing meeting is correct before we save it we're going to define, we know the meeting row is in B4 if it's an existing, and we know the meeting row is in B, the meeting ID is in B3. But if it's a new meeting, what is the meeting ID? This is where a lot of you get tripped up. Our new, let me show you that meeting ID. We use numerical meeting IDs. They're all numerical. What is it? Our new meeting ID is the maximum of this plus one. We're using the max formula. Next, meeting ID is the max formula. Meeting ID, remember we've defined that list in a range, plus one. So it's going to be the maximum of all of the meeting IDs plus one. That's how we get our next meeting ID, and we place that right here. So our next meeting ID, when we have new meetings, is in going to be six. So we've covered that right here. So B6, if it's a new meeting, that's going to tell us 16, right? We only have up to 15. So we know our next one's going to be 16, and we know where to place it. So that's going to be helpful moving forward in our code. So if it's existing, our meeting ID is in B6. B3, we're going to set B3 to equal our meeting ID. If it's new, I want the meeting ID to show up in B3. If it's existing, we already know our meeting ID is in B3. All right, next up, now that we have the meeting row and the meeting ID, the rest is the same, whether it's new or whether it's an existing. Sheet 6C and the meeting row, that's our meeting ID. Meeting name is in column D, date, start time, duration, and agenda. So all of this based on the specific fields, since we know the meeting row, and what that's going to do is that's going to either update or add information here. ID and C, name D, date, and E, et cetera, et cetera. So based on whatever row, it's going to add all this information, in, or it's going to replace the information if it's an existing meeting. So that is how we handle that. Next up, we have to add and update the attendees. So first off, we want to do is we want to get the last attendee row. We need that in M4. We need to know the last row of attendees in our actual schedule. So what's got, that's going to do is going to determine the last row in column M. In this case, it's 14, but you may have a lot of attendees that may be down here. So it's going to get that last row and it's going to pull it right from here. Next up, we have, if it's less than 9, we need to go to last attendees. So for example, if that row is less, that last row is less than 9, we're going to skip all of this and go right here. 
All right, for attendee row, we're going to run a loop. We're going to run a for next loop for each specific attendee. We're going to do these things. Starting in row nine and going to the last attendee row, we're going to check. First, we need to know if it's an existing or new attendee. And we can use that. We want to make sure that there is a value in M, actually. So we want to make sure that there is a value. And next up, we need to check if it's empty, if it's an existing or not. Let me show you what I mean by that. In this case, we haven't added any new. But what if, we add, what if it's an existing meeting and we add a new attendee? These have linked database rows. This does not. So I need to check. If it's an existing row, we just need to update it. If it's a new row, we need to add this attendee on the last row. So for example, if it's a new attendee, we need to go all the way to the bottom and add it right here with the ID, with the name, the status, the column, et cetera, row, et cetera. So we need to add it. If it's an existing one, we will pull it and add it and put the information right here. So. We need to check, is this blank, is N in the row blank or not? So we've done that. If it's blank, it's new. If it's not, it's existing. So if N in the attendee row does not equal empty, then the database row is equal to N in the attending row, the database row. So if it's else, if it's blank, then we know we need to know the attending attendance database row is the last row plus one, the last row with data plus one. So we know to get that row. That would be a new row for the attendee database. And then if it is new, we also want to put that number in N. So we know when we save it, it gets saved automatically. So we're going to add it right there in N as well. Add in the database row if it's not existing. Now we're ready. Regardless if it's new or not, we've set the parameters. Now we can say, sheet 4c is, is the meeting ID in the attendance. Then we're going to add in the name, then status, then the schedule row, because I need to know what row it's on in the schedule, and then the formulas, because we run the advanced filter, I need to know what row that is on in the database. So we add all that information into the attendee database right here. So we add in all that information, whether it's ID, name, status, schedule row, the row that it's on the schedule, and the database row. So we add in all that here with the row. In this case, it's row, row. So we add that in. All right, so we've now we know we've added all that in. Next up, we're going to add the attachments, and we're going to go through the same, pretty much the same process with the attachments. All right, and when we save meeting attachments, we also have a very similar process here. Here we have our four attachments, we have our database, and we have our long file name here. Let's go ahead and take a look at, into the attachments database. So if we were to add one new one here, let's go ahead and add a new one here, and we'll see that this does not have a database assigned. So the next one available in the attachments will be 21. That's the next one available. So when we go ahead and update and we save those changes, you'll see that it assigned it to row 21 and here when we look back on now 21 it's got the id our file name our file path and row and database row let's go into the code and update that and take a look so again last attachments row if it's less than 23 we need to make sure there's no attachments our attachments start at row 23 then we're going to run a loop from our from 23 to our last attachments row. For each attachment, we're going to check to make sure there is actually a file name there. O is where our name's gonna go, so we wanna make sure that there is actually an attachment there. Moving along, if there is, we're gonna determine whether it's new or not attachment. If Q is not empty, then it is an existing attachment. We know that Q holds our attachment database row. However, if it's new, that means if Q and the attachment row is blank, we are going to assign a row based on the first available row in our database, which is sheet two, our attachments database, C plus the last row plus one. It's gonna assign that. Then it's gonna put that row right in there. Again, let me go over that process once more for you. Our first available row is 22 in our attachments. So when we go ahead and select on a new one, we click add file, we add a specific file, we click OK, and now it's blank. It's blank. So what it's going to do is going to say, oh, 
Well, we have not added this yet, so let's pull it. Let's find the first available row, 22. Then we're going to put that right here when we save it. So we click Save Changes. It finds that row. It finds the first available row and it puts it right in 22 here. So it takes all the information and puts it right here. And now it's saved. Now we can pull it up for next time. All right, so that's what we do. And then we just basically, once we have that database row, we then add the meeting ID, the file name, the path, the the attachment schedule row, that's the row in our schedule, plus the database row. We add all that into our attachments database. So then we would skip, if there's no attachments, we would skip here. We go through this loop for every single attachments. Then we, of course, we set, we've just saved our attachments. So we want to set the new meeting group to false. It's no longer new because we just saved it. And our existing meeting group button set gets displayed, B5 gets to false, it's no longer a new meeting no matter what, even if existing or, or new, we've now set B5 to false, denoting that the uh, specific meeting is no longer new. Next, I want to refresh the schedule, so we're going to load month, and then I'm going to create this fade out message with this macro, meeting save message. We've gone over fade out messages, but basically it just takes that shape and it fades it out. It displays it, and then it fades it out. So you've seen that. Let's go back into the code. When we save our changes, you'll see that fade out message appear and then all those changes. So that is how we save a specific meeting. Next up, we've gone covered that. We've covered our save meeting. Now we have pop-up calendar. We've gone over before. This is just uh, the pop-up calendar. I have a specific video for this calendar, which you can view in my YouTube channel. There, I have that already. Scheduling Max. This is the last one for our scheduling macros. Next up, we have the add attachments file. This is just simply adding a folder. We don't need this. We're not going to add any filters, so we don't need that row. We can give them the ability to attach any type of file, so there are no filters necessary. All this is going to do when we click Add Attachments, that's that button. When we click that button, it's going to do two things. It's going to place in, oh, the file name. Just the file name is the directory of the selected item. And then what I want is I want the entire path. That entire path is going to go in column R. Let me show you how that works. So again, we click on Add File. That macro runs. We select a specific item, the file name, and only the file name gets put here, and our entire file name, the entire file path, is in column R. So O and R. That's how that's done. That is all that that macro does. So now that we have that, we have loading the month. All right, this is a little bit bigger macro. We'll go through it. First, we've defined our dimensions. We have our long dimensions for our rows. We have our meeting count. We need to know the number of meetings when we load a schedule. I need to know the number of meetings where to place it. For example, there's four meetings in this particular day, just one in this. So I need to keep track of the count of the meetings. So we use a meeting count in that instance. And I also want to find the month dates, and we'll show you that as well. Find dates and found dates, because I need to know when I run through those meetings, I need to know what date and what date I should put those meetings. So I'll show you that. Meeting date as a date. We're going to stop the calculations, and we're going to be working with sheet one. The first thing I want to do is I want to find, the, I want to set a range for finding month dates. And I'll show you what that range is. That range is right here. And what this is, is all of the dates in our calendar. This is the same thing as our calendar here, except it's got all dates, all of these ranges, and linked right here. So it's basically just those dates. So when we go to next month, you'll see that the first three are blank, right? Because it's simply a link. This is the same formula that we use right here. It's the same formula. It's just in this in this case, it's horizontally into seven rows, and in this case, it's vertically into a single column. Why do I use a single column? Because I need to find the date. When I load a meeting, I need to know where the date is, and I need to know what column and what row. For example, August 1st is in column 7, row 6, and I need to know that information because I need to know where to place the meeting. August 1st is right here. Column G is column 7, row 5. But it's going to start in row six, right? Because we, we're not going to place the meeting here. I'm going to place it right here. That first meeting will go in row six, 
column five. So we it's like a mapping. It tells us column seven, row six. Column eight, row six. This would be column eight, row twelve. So the ninth is column eight, row twelve. Let's take a look at that. Column the ninth is column eight, row twelve. So I basically mapped out. So when we find a meeting with a date, right? If I find August sixteenth, I have a meeting. I know what column to put it in and I know what row to put it in. Now it's going to be this row, but if there's already existing meetings, it's going to skip one. That's why we count the rows. Let's go back to July and we'll go ahead and update. So when we know the first meeting is going to go in column in row 18, the second meeting of that specific day is going to go in row 19 and so on and so forth. So that's why we have to count that. So we're going to set that because we're going to use it when we come across the date. I need to know that. So we need to set that range. Next up, we're going to clear all of the contents when we're loading the month. I want to clear all of the details in that schedule so that we can load the new information. So we clear that. We also clear old criteria and results. What is this? Let's go ahead and take a look. In the meeting list, I need to clear. We're gonna we're gonna run uh we're gonna run a criteria. We're gonna start that criteria July first, and we're gonna end it. I know I need to know all the meetings in that month. So we're gonna run that filter, and we're gonna return only the meetings in that month. Let's go ahead and create a meeting. I don't even have any meetings outside of that month. Let's go ahead and create one meeting. All right. Let's go ahead and create a meeting for a different month. Test. And the start time, we'll just give it a start time of 1245. It's not important. We're going to click a different month, June 5th, and create a duration. And then we're going to save that meeting. So now we have one meeting on in June. So that's so it's here, one meeting in June, and the rest in July. So when we run that filter and we look in the meeting, we'll see that obviously the meeting here in June, June 5th, is not going to obviously be in the results. Right? So that meeting, so it's Meeting ID number 16 is not going to show up because we're only want I only want dates greater than or equal to July 1st or dates less than or equal to July 31st. So that's why. So basically what I want to do is I want to run through this list. I want to look at each date and I want to know for each date where does it fall on our schedule. For each date, if it's if it's the 8th, it's going to fall in column 4 and it's going to start at row 12. So that's why I need that. It's very important. That helps us fill out this schedule. So moving back into the code, we now we're going to clear out the old criteria. Again, we're going to add in our dates. AC2 is greater than, I just showed that to you, greater than or equal to B8. What's in B8 and B9? B8 and B9, if you remember, are our starting points and our ending points for the dates. B8 is our first day of the month. B9 is our last day. I want to take these two values and I want to add less than or equal to, and I want to add greater than or equal to this and less than or equal. So I want to take those values and I want to place them right here and I'm going to add those symbols onto that. And that helps us do that. So next up we have our, let's go ahead and back into the code so we know how to put those in our criteria. Then what I want to do is I want to get the last meeting row of our meeting list because when we run our advanced filters I need to know that last row. Now we're ready, we've cleared out the information, we've put in our criteria, we've gotten the last row, and we're ready to run our advanced filter. Our advanced filter from sheet 6 which is our meeting list starts at C3 It must include those headers. Those headers are in row 3. H is the last column, the last row we've defined from this line. We're going to run that advanced filter. We're going to copy over the information. We're going to use criteria AA1 through AF2. That's going to include those dates as we just saw. AA1 through AF2 is going to include those dates. That's going to run our criteria. It's going to return our results in AA3 through AD3. That's where our results are going to go. Copy to range. Again, our results AA3 all the way over to AD3 and we want unique values. That's going to get our results. Next up, we need to know the last filter row. I need to know the last row of our new data. And we're going to check to make sure there is data, just as we check always when we run an advanced filter. That's going to give us our last row, which is AB14. So we can start at 4 and run our loop to AB14 so that we can start adding all this meeting data into our schedule right here. That's where we want to put it. So we need to run that, fill, run that loop through each of those results. 
So again, we're going to then, but before I do that, I want to sort them. Why do I want to sort them? Well, because I want 6.15 meeting to show up before the 10.15 p.m. and I want to show the order. They may not, when we return our advanced filter, they could be in any order. So the first thing I want to do is I want to run a sort for our start times. And the next thing I want to do is run a sort through our dates. So that way, when we have meetings, let's say 19, there's four meetings on the 19th. First, they're sorted by the time. So 6.15 a.m., then 8.30, then 9.15, then 10.15, and then also on the dates. So everything is sorted. So we run two sorts, the first one time, the second one date, and we'll walk through on the code. That way, when they get into our calendar, they're going to be done exactly in the right order, which we've done. So the first sort we're going to run is AD3. AD3 is our times. And we're going to run that filter based on that. And that's going to we're going to apply that, and that's based on the times. The next one we're going to run is AC3. That is the date. So first time then the date and we're going to run that sort and that sort sorts both first by time then by date so that they're in the correct order as I've just explained. Now we're ready to run our loop. So now in the loop we have the filter row from four to the last filter row. Those are going to be all the meetings in that month. We're going to run that loop. The meeting date we know is in column AC so we're going to set that meeting note. Next up I need to find what the column in the row for that meeting date so we're going to run a find using the find. Set the found month dates equal to find the month dates find the meeting date next to value. What basically what that code does is it takes this meeting date right here, 7-3, and then it's going to go into this range right here. And it's going to find 7-3 in that range. And then what I want to do is, okay, now I know it's found. Now I want to take whatever row and I want to get this column and this row. These two values are important. These two values. So I need that because I need to know where to place that meeting information. So if it's not found, it says if not found is nothing. This is a double negative. That means it is found. Is when it's found, we know the schedule column is in A, B, found the month and the row. And the row is in A, C. A, B, and A, C. That's the rows. So here, A, B is the column. A, C is the row. So we've defined the column in the row. We know what to set it on. So we've done that right here. The schedule column is A, B. The schedule row is A, C. Now we're going to run our loop. Why do we need one more loop? Because I need to add, there's multiple meetings in a single day, very possibly. So I need to run a loop. And what we're going to do is we're going to first check five is the four meetings is the maximum or five is the maximum so we're going to set the if meeting count equals five then the meeting count equals four this just helps us so we don't have so if we schedule 10 meetings in a day then we don't want our schedule to get mixed up we are just going to put a maximum of five next up we're going to add this information the, the schedule row on sheet one sells the schedule row plus the meeting count right the meeting count it's going to start off our meeting count starts off at zero, obviously, and plus the schedule column equals, what does it equal? AD, sheet six, AD in the filter row. What is that? That's the time, right? And we're going to format that time with this, hours, and then A and PM. We're going to just give it a very short format. So we want to put in that time. AD of that filter is where our times are located. AD is our time, start time right here. Then I'm going to put in the name, AB. So all I want is the time formatted and the, and the name of the meeting. And I want to put that right here. I'm going to put that right here. First the time formatted, you see small a, right? And the name. That's all we're going to do right there. So cells is the name. Then we're going to give it a space. And then AB. AB is the name of the meeting. So we're going to put that right there. And one more very important thing, we need to add in that ID. Remember, we need to know, remember, the, the meeting ID, and we're going to place it exactly 50 columns to the right, 50 columns. So we're going to place that meeting ID right here. That's important when we load it. We need to have that. So we do that with that second line of code right here. The schedule row plus any meeting counts plus the schedule column plus 50 plus 50 equals AA and the filter row value. What's AA and the filter row? That's the meeting ID. AA and the filter row 
right here, AA, meeting ID, that's our meeting ID right here. So we place that and we place it right here because when we load it, we need to know what meeting. Here you go. So it's here. Those are our meeting IDs. We need that. That's very important. So moving along, we have that. Now we've run it. We run this for each for each of our meetings in our results route, and that's it. Then we we just go to and with and reset the calculations. That's done. We also have macros for previous month and scheduled month. All we do is change the month name number here. If it's, for example, if B7, we're going previous month. If B7, B7 holds our month number. If it's 1 and we're going previous, then we need to set B7 to 12. Otherwise, B7 is simply B7 minus 1. And the same thing for next month. If we're going forward and it's 12, then we need to go, if it's 12 December, we need to set it to January. And we also need to set B7. And then we need to load the month. Let's go ahead. I'm going to create this. We need to increase the year by one, too. Let's go ahead and show you how we do that. So I want to make sure if we're going from December, I want to increase our year. Let's go ahead and add that in right now. Our year is located in S4, so let's increase this by 1 in our code. We can do that simply by going here, dot range S4 dot value equals, and we're going to say S4 plus 1, so we can copy and paste this. And that way it'll increase our year as well, plus 1, and then just we'll add in the equals. Okay, good. And now we'll do the same thing for the previous year, but we're going to subtract 1 here for the previous year. We're going previous. If it's 12, in this case, we're going to minus 1. There we go. Now we're set. Now we now the years will change along with the months. So that is it. And then, of course, the last, we want to reload the month. So that is it. That is how we do that. So that way, when we're going previous and we select next month, next month, next month, next month, it will change the year automatically to 2019 when we're when we hit January of 2019. All right, there we go. That is it. That is how you change the code. Uh, that is for that. And we've gone over a lot today in this way extended training. We've got a ton of training. We covered a lot. We've covered how to create a meeting. We're going to take your suggestions. We need to add the communications point onto this where we email automatically. In our staff list, we've stored emails here so we can then update our staff based on meeting additions and changes. So we're going to do that in the, the next one. Of course, I love your likes and shares. And please, of course, don't forget to comment below with any ideas or comments you may have. Thank you so much for joining us today on this fantastic training. I really appreciate all of your support and continue doing a great job. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not done it already. And thank you very much for joining. Thank you.